You're tuning into Work That Matters, the official Shaleda podcast. To learn more about us, visit shaleda.com, C-H-L-O-E-T-A.com. All right. Welcome to the Work That Matters podcast. My name is Emily Cochran. I am the Vice President of Business Development here at Shaleda. I have with me Chet Dodrell, who is our Vice President of Contract Administration. And our guest today is Ryan Pingree, who is the owner and environmental planner for Scout Environmental. Welcome to the podcast, Ryan. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, Emily. All right. Well, we're going to start off, I think, Ryan, if you'll kind of just give us your professional background, where you started, what you're working on now, that sort of thing. We can Okay. Yeah, just listen on that. Right on. Um, sounds good. Well, it's, it's a great joy to be here at Shaleta World Headquarters. I mean, this place is so impressive. Um, it's great to, to walk through and see all the people and the professional space you have. Um, you know, having not been here before and, and seen your place, it's really, um, you know, eye-opening and really, really sharp, really good stuff. So congrats to Thank you, you guys and all your success. After six years of partnership, we've each only visited each yeah. other's offices <laughs> one time. Right, right. <laughs> see so. each other far more often on Teams on than, teams, yeah. Yeah, so. than in person. Teams and <laughs> conferences yeah. and the like. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so uh, I am a environmental planner uh, preparing NEPA documents, so a project manager primarily for the federal government within the Department of Defense, and that's been my technical career for almost 25 years now. Um, But within the last six years, I've been the president and one of the co-founders and co-owners of Scout Environmental. Uh, Scout, as we like to say, um, we are a service-disabled veteran-owned small business, and we're headquartered in San Diego County. And uh, we support our clients nationwide. And uh, we're in our sixth year. We have about 25 employees now, uh, primarily supporting the federal government um, with environmental planning, environmental compliance, and newly uh, some engineering services on the facility condition assessment, also some supporting studies work. Um, So that's kind of what I've done recently and and doing now. Awesome, yeah. Chet, will you kind of uh, elaborate on the... Um, the professional relationship that we've had with Scout and how we met them. and Yeah, uh, Scout's been a, a key teaming partner of ours for six years now, really. Um, going back to some of their startup days, um, we got introduced by some mutual contacts, and um, they told us that these guys are starting out and they do really quality work. So we... Uh, um, had them on our team for some contracts, and um, it's been a very beneficial partnership ever since then. We've done a variety of contracts for multiple different environmental services, um, several environmental assessments. Um, We're doing categorical exclusions for the USGS up in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I think we've done about 150 plus um, reports on that project. We've uh, worked on uh, assessment of the environmental management system for the um, for the Navajo Nation, uh, environmental assessments uh, at McDill Air Force Base, uh, really all over the country with different projects and um, several ongoing right now. Yeah, it's been great. Um, I know, Scout, you guys have gotten a pr- couple of, like, pretty big contracts recently. Like, um, you're on a, is it an ECS may talk? An AE, you got an AE. Yep. Right. Right. Yeah, a couple a couple of big wins for us. But um, if I could go back a little bit in time, and you know, when Jason, Melanie, and I started Scout, you know, there was three of us, you know, just sitting in a in a small room trying to figure out what what have we done and what are we going to do. Um, but really, the the success and really vitality of Scout would not have been possible without the support of of you guys in particular. You know, we. We didn't have a contract vehicle. We didn't have a GSA schedule, but we had relationships, right? People that were willing to trust us and partner with us and give us a chance to, you know, do great work for our clients and partners and make a little money and literally put food on the table at home, right, after taking a big risk. So like you and Mark, um, you know, started in your early days, Mark was telling me about, yep. you know, how you know, started in the, you know, in the, the, the house, right? Yeah, yeah. The, ups, the upstairs of Mark's house. Yeah. yeah. Dirt floor barn the good old, yeah, in Jay, they, Oklahoma. The, the good old days, as some would call it. <laughs> and here you are now in a corporate business park with thousands of square feet. So, um, but that success wouldn't be possible without partnership and doing quality work and client service and proactive management, all these things. 
Um, but all of that is to say, to get back to your question, Emily, is it's a building block to what sort of successes you know we can you know win together, have realized, um, and by building on those individual projects, uh, being a subcontractor, we're now in a position where we can compete and win contracts as a prime either by ourselves uh, or with teaming partners, whether they're with Sholeda or with a large business through the SBA Mentor Protege program. There's all those opportunities came about from relationships when we, we first opened the door. Yeah, I feel like I always say that, you know, relationships are one of the biggest uh, advancements in, in, or like ways to advance in government contracting, especially, but I would say, especially in the environmental realm, a lot, a lot of that work is, um, you know, you have to have team partners, you have to have, um, good relationships with, with other people like we do. So, um, yeah, I'm, it's been it's been really good. And getting a variety of teaming partners that have different certifications yes. and contract vehicles and complementary skill sets. All of that, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. It helps open opportunities, right? Um, you know, when you guys were an A A, right, and we were SDVOSB, we're able to leverage those socioeconomic um, opportunities. But at the end of the day. It's all about quality the and delivering the product, right? Absolutely. You, you know, just because you're an SDVOSB doesn't mean you're going to get a contract because you got to deliver, mm -hmm. right? Same thing with the ADA program, which you guys are a successful graduate. Yep. It's definitely been a beneficial partnership, uh, not only for, for Scout, but for us too, as we've further developed our environmental program. So it's definitely been a, a mutually beneficial relationship. That's for sure. Definitely. Well, since we're kind of already in that vein of, you know, entrepreneurship and, that sort of thing. I might skip to this last question here. Um, what was your biggest challenge starting Scout when you guys started out, just the three of you? Wow, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I, I remember the first day driving to work, being so excited. It was January 1st, 2018. It's like, started our own business. Here it is, you know, thought about it, planned about it, for, for planned it for a long time. And being so excited going to work that day, Jason and Melanie, you know, we sat down, we talked about, all right, this is it, this first day, this is all the things we're going to do. And then driving home that night, I went, holy cow, what have I done? <laughs> yep. It was reality because I realized all the hard work that was ahead of us, yep. right? Yep. Um, so it, we like to say you kind of make your own luck in some respects, but you need to have some luck. You need to have patience. You need to believe in yourself and your partners. Um, Jason and Melanie and I have a lot of, you know, trust and past work with each other, um, and we complement each other, you know, nicely. So having, having that part of our relationship and our business squared away wasn't something that, you know, really worried, worried us. What the challenges were, were getting out and finding work, right? Yep. Because without a contract vehicle in the federal government, you're really dead in the water. You know, either as a subcontractor or ideally as a prime contractor. So. Without that, what we had to do is we had to get out and meet people. We had to be introduced by mutual friends, yep. right? And, you know, we had some client contacts that were willing to take a shot at Scout. But they're like, well, how do we get to you, right? So we would have to go to other businesses and say, hey, if we bring a project to your contract, would you be willing to give us a little piece? And little piece, like literally crumbs off the table. It didn't take much to, you know, keep us, keep us busy. Um, at least initially. So um, having the confidence and faith in yourself and your partners that you've done the right thing and the positive outlook, and um, those are all attributes you need to have. Uh, but yeah, there are, a lot of, there are a lot of opportunities or a lot of um, roadblocks to being a successful business. And if I could just kind of an aside on that, I think it was year three at the Samey Small Business Conference. You know, they do these presentations, these uh, seminars on different topics. And before we went, we were looking over the list of, of talks, and one of them stood out, and it was why most small businesses fail and what makes those that don't succeed. And it had a little blurb in there, and it talked about, I think the, the, the percentage was over two-thirds of all small businesses fail within the first two years. And this was year three for wow, us. So yeah. I turned to Melanie. I said, yeah. hey, Melanie, we're, we're not one of that. Yeah. We're not that yeah. statistic. We, we beat it. We beat it, right? So, um, you know, it just, it, you know, hard work, some luck, perseverance, teaming partners. Um, you you got to have money. You yeah. know, you need to have funding, right? So 
you know, taking out personal loans, taking out loans for the company, and then, you know, people believing in you that you're going to pay those back down the road, which we've been doing, which is, it feels great to be able to um, deliver on the, on the trust that was put in you by either friends, f uh, family, or even the bank, right? Yeah, yeah. All those, all those yeah. milestones are another um, attribute to success and that you're doing the right thing. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Just Absolutely. Keep on trucking, man. I, I know Mark and Chet, when he was first starting out, you know, we kind of talked about that, but it was, it's a rough time for a lot of people in the first, but you just keep going and suddenly you'll, you know, you'll hit some stride and maybe start, start growing more and more. So. Yeah, it's, it's never an easy, uh, never an easy process starting a business. You know, that's, there's all kinds of, roadblocks and particularly ones you probably don't even think about until until right they occur. yeah insurance um, we need to have insurance yeah. and right. so many things. little things you yeah. just don't we, hr there's you know laws we need to comply with there's all these things that if you just want to go out and sell what you know how to do to your clients right that's great but you, right. you need the whole back side right. of the business that's going to operate the financials and the compliance and the reporting um and that's that's, I think that's probably a challenge for a lot of companies that get started with the mindset of, Hey, I've got this great skill. I can go sell it Yep. and right. you go do it. And right. then it's like, Oh my gosh, I'm not sending out invoices. I'm not getting paid. I didn't pay the rent. You know, all these, and it's like, that takes your time and energy away from your clients. Doing the actual, and yeah, then it becomes this really a big challenge to balance that. So luckily with at least initially Jason, Melanie and myself, we were able to complement each other and fulfill those roles so that we could collectively have a good platform for success and then hire people along the way that that was their primary skill set, right? So that yes. freed us up to do right. the things that we do best. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's what, do you, what do you think was the uh, biggest hurdle to overcome in starting Scout? Taking a risk, leaving the three of us all had really good jobs with a great employer. And it wasn't that we didn't like working there, but it was we wanted to try something bigger. Right. So two kids at home, right? Yeah. Melanie, three kids at home, yeah. Jason, two kids at home. And do we really want to throw away our, our nice jobs and take a risk and chance on ourselves? Right. That's, that's a hard thing to do. And it's a hard conversation with your spouse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm glad that it's, uh, shaping up for you guys. Yeah. Cause yeah. Thank but you. That is a very big risk. Yeah. So, yeah. so far so good, but yeah. with, as you guys have seen too, with growth, and success comes new challenges, right? Yep. You know? Absolutely. Are there any specific strategies? I mean, we've kind of talked about building relationships, getting those contract vehicles. Um, and those are, you know, pretty big strategies to win federal contracts. But is there anything else that you guys have, have done strategy wise to win, start winning more contracts? Yeah, I'll, I'll highlight one, and I, I got to give Melanie credit for this. So we, um, as part of our planning before launching Scout, we said we're going to do this is Melanie's. Uh, we do a monthly blog, right? We're going to pick a topic that we think our readers would find of interest, um, and then we're also going to do a monthly newsletter, which you, you guys see these now, right? Yes. Um, so yeah. we try and tailor those newsletters and those blogs to be relevant to the work that we do and the people that are interested in reading it, right? Um, so it's not, it, it doesn't immediately bring in work, but what it does is it keeps Scout's name out there. We try and, you know, curate the material to make it of interest um, so that people keep us in mind, yes. right? So when an opportunity comes up, like, oh, I need to team with somebody who can, you know, help us with an EMS. Oh, oh, oh the Scout newsletter just arrived. That's right. You know, Jason can help me out with that. So um, I'm pretty proud. Or I'm very proud that, that Melanie and her, her leadership and her diligence, we have every month we have put out a blog and every month we put out a newsletter. We haven't missed one yet and we keep growing our subscription list. So, um, you know, just keeping, it's another way to keep your name out there and provide value and people can not read it. They can unsubscribe. That's fine. But it's just another way to, you know, keep, you know, to put your name out there and also demonstrate how you're, you're, you're relevant within the, the industry. It, you know, we talk about 
we get those newsletters and every time we're like, this is so cool. Oh, <laughs> awesome. They're so well written and like informative. Yeah. And it does, you know, I think go to show that you can be trusted with this kind of work because you know what you're talking about and then you're staying on top of things. So yeah, it's a uh, props to Melanie. Yeah. It's very yeah. impressive. Yeah. Yeah, both from a content perspective, it always keeps us up to date on the latest okay. trends, which I think from a, you know, in our industry, we're subject matter expertise and that we know what we're talking yes. about matters a lot. Yes. You know, that's uh, really important. And then just from a from a visual perspective, I know that we've uh, we've sent it on to our marketing folks before and being like, yeah. this is an example of right a good on. thing we that's like good to hear. Yeah. Well, we're, you know, we've kind of given a lot of information about the entrepreneurship and um, what it takes to, you know, really start a company. Is there any other advice that you would give other than I mean, you've kind of already given, you know, persevere, take a leap? Um, you know, just do great work for your clients and your partners. Be, be transparent, be honest, um, and be committed, yeah. right? Um, yeah, we have, we have three core values at Scout and those three core values answer every question we come across. Whenever we're in a difficult situation, we don't know what to do. We go and one of those three will solve it for us. So the first one is bring your A game. Okay. So you always got to give your best effort for your client and for your partners and your teammates. And if you're not going to bring your next best, best effort, then you better fix it. If not, the Scout's not the place for you, right? It's that simple. Um, the next one, is to do the right thing, right? So a perfect example, Chet, was yep. what happened today. Yep. Right? Today, you know, that we, we discovered an, an error, an accounting error, so we fixed it, right? So not that I'm saying anyone would do this, but it might have just gone down the river and no one would have been any wiser, right? But that's not doing the right thing. And the last thing is to enjoy the ride. So you got to have that right mix of work and family life or, you know, if you like, you know, going running or, you know, sailing or whatever it is, having the time to do those things because uh, we don't want to burn people out. You want to make sure you have time with your family and that when you show up to work, you're ready to work, right? So when you're at work, you're at work. And when you're at, at home or your son's baseball game, you're doing that. I, you know, I, I like to say when, when you're on vacation, I better not get an email from you because you're on vacation and I need you to have that time to recharge, focus on the moment that you're in and not be worrying about email. So, um, that's, I guess, another technique, uh, but really it's those three core values and we have them, um, stylistically presented in our office and I hundred percent, any issue, any challenge we run across, we just go, all right, which one of these core values is going to solve it for us today? That's really good. I like that. Thank you. Okay, well, you know, we'll kind of move into um, a different area now. So you've we've talked about your, you know, subject matter expertise um, in your environmental background. So we might um, just sort of talk about if there's any any new updates, new regulations from the environmental world, um, anything else like that you want to discuss today. Yeah, there's, there's a lot going on. Even today with the Clean Water Act and the Supreme Court coming out with a ruling, right, that most, most people anticipated was coming because uh, the Clean Water Act from 1972 was, frankly, poorly, poorly defined in what, um, what constitutes a water feature that falls within under the jurisdiction of the Army Corps of Engineers, which would then drive um, permitting and also state-level um, permitting and certifications as well under the Clean Water Act. All that to say, there's been many challenges to the Clean Water Act over the years. And today we saw that the Supreme Court um, came out with a five to four decision that basically narrowed the scope of regulatory authority for the Clean Water Act, and specifically as it relates to wetlands. So uh, in the past, the definition of a wetland as being jurisdictional or not has been um, the, the, the word adjacent adjacent is the word so you could have a you know a wetland here and then there's a traditional navigable waterway here a river if there's space between the two is this wetland also considered jurisdictional even though maybe it only connects during extreme flood events right, right. so it's kind of a gray area but in the 
Generally speaking, that wetland has been considered jurisdictional, which triggers the need for permits and coordination and, and mitigation sometimes, right? Well, the Supreme Court has taken that adjacent and replaced it with another A word, adjoining, right? So now when you have your, let's see, get, there we go, your <laughs> wetland and your river in the past with that distance, that could be considered jurisdictional, but now it needs to be like this, adjoining, right? Yeah. So this wetland out here today. Sorry about you. Right? <laughs> not covered. Yeah. It, um, so that's that's a big, big ruling. It's not surprising. Mm -hmm. It looked like the, the court was going to be going this way. You know, meanwhile, the uh, EPA and the Biden administration are coming up with a new definition for um, jurisdictional waters of the United States, waters of the United States, excuse me. Um, so we'll have to see how that definition may change in light of the Supreme Court decision. So what does this mean for our clients, right? At the yes, end of the day, yeah. let's get down to it. What does it mean for our clients? So um, it could reduce the scope of Clean Water Act compliance requirements, permitting, mitigation, if a, a project, I mean, certainly our clients want to do the right thing and avoid impacting sensitive habitats. Wetlands are considered a sensitive habitat. So if you can situate your project to avoid impacting the wetlands, that's the best first practice, right. irrespective of um, the law and what is a wetland and what isn't, uh, what's jurisdictional. Um, but it could reduce the permitting requirements on some of our clients for their projects when there are unavoidable impacts, because sometimes there are, you know, due, due to mission requirements or, you know, just situations, something needs to go there. And yes, there's going to be impacts we're going to mitigate for them. So maybe now that's not going to result in a, um, a Clean Water Act issue, and it's a more straightforward process, right? So that could be one outcome. Uh, on the flip side, um, you know, there's going to be some groups that are going to be, you know, really upset about this because it could lead to more development into sensitive areas without any mitigation, right, offsetting those impacts. Um, so, but primarily for the federal government, which does a really good job, uh, our clients do a great job of avoiding first and then minimizing second. Um, if that avoidance and minimization still would result in some impacts, maybe now they won't have to have as great of a, Clean Water Act compliance um, requirement. Right. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. that was. Yeah. But stay tuned. We'll see. Yeah. See how yeah. it all shakes out. Yep. Yeah. Subject to change. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure there will be some. Well, I'm not sure, but there may be some challenges. I'm not an attorney. Melanie's an attorney. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a Clean Water Act uh, attorney as well on our staff. Oh, nice. Um, so you know we can help our clients interpret this. And I just, I thought it was timely for today, it right? Was. It was. Yeah. yeah. It's I'm pretty looking, exciting. I'm looking forward to the blog entry. Yeah, yeah I'm sure it. It, it, Melanie's probably got it in the works with, no. with Jack, Jack Kearns right now. So we'll see how it goes. All right. Are there any other regulations or new rules that have, or any other things to discuss on that? Front? Yes. So uh, the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA. NEPA. Right. Yep. It's a big deal. Our big favorite. deal. It, it, drives a lot of our business. Um, each year, the National Association of Environmental Professionals, NEAP, holds what is in effect a NEPA conference. Uh, and it was just two weeks ago in Phoenix. So Melanie and I went, uh, a bunch of other NEPA nerds, as we like to call ourselves, were there. And a great uh, symposium, uh, speakers, you know, leaders um, in, the, in the industry sharing their, uh, their projects how they've been navigating uh, some of the changes to the NEPA requirements. Um, so uh, back in 2020, uh, the Trump administration, there were really the first substantial changes to the NEPA regulations. Uh, CEQ, Council of Environmental Quality, put those out at that time. And, you know, depending on your perspective, those changes maybe weren't, weren't all that great or maybe they were really good, depending on what side of the fence you sit on, right? Um, it's all about getting NEPA done faster. Why does an EIS take year, eight years to complete? Why is an EA still going three years on? Why can't people get their act together and streamline <laughs> yeah. these things, right? Well, 
Scout, Shalea, we're aware of these streamlining and getting NEPA. How quickly can I check the NEPA box, right? So I can go right. build my project. This, the NEPA thing, what is the NEPA thing, right? So we always you know, try and get things done quicker um, without sacrificing quality regardless. But here now, CEQ, who's Grand Puba of NEPA, is saying, hey, you need to do things faster um, and maybe narrow the scope of your analysis. Cumulative effects, not really concerned about that. You just focus on direct impacts of your project. Greenhouse gas emissions, yeah, not so much. You know, Just get through your project, your, the NEPA, get the NEPA done quickly and you know, we're going to... Interesting, yeah. yeah. So that's I, where... Yeah. I was going to say, I think I read an article the other day that was describing some of the uh, Trump administration era guidelines to reduce the length of an EIS to ideally no more than 150 pages. And I think it said that uh, average length was running somewhere around 660 pages. Yeah. So in that Ooh, ballpark. Man. So it's... Yeah. The goal was pretty substantial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, as we like to say in, when I was in the Navy, is get it done faster and funnier, right? <laughs> you know, make this easy to read and get it done fast, right? right? So lots of pictures, graphics. But the whole thing about NEPA is, is you know, transparency, disclosing the project to stakeholders, the public, agencies, and informing the decision maker, whoever that is, so they're aware of the impacts of the project they're signing off on, right? Yeah. But a big part of that is public engagement, Um and having given the opportunity, especially for controversial projects, for stakeholders, people would be affected by the project to provide input, right? Have a yeah. voice. That's that's the idea. So that's where we were in 2020. New administration came in um, in April of 2022. So about a year ago, CEQ came out with what they called Phase One of two phased changes, two phases of changes to the NEPA regulations. Right. So new administration comes in and says, you know what? I think we need to add some, some heft back into NEPA. You know, we're going to start off by putting cumulative effects back in there, indirect effects. You need to look at those as well. Um, we need to um, understand that NEPA is, is, doesn't set a ceiling for analysis. It's rather a floor. So agencies can go beyond the minimum requirements if they want to. They don't have to stop at a certain level. And Engagement with stakeholders is an important element. You know, and that's what NEPA was, is a, is a disclosure, a transparency thing. And here you are reducing the opportunities. You know, that's kind of runs contrary to yeah. the idea. So that phase one came out. Um, and, you know, the big thing there is, you know, the cumulative impacts, um, giving people the opportunity to, to be more involved, and then allowing agencies to kind of set their own scope of NEPA analysis, right? So phase one, where's phase two, yeah. right? Right. So uh, phase two is in the works. Um, it should be coming out soon based on uh, information that CEQ provided. Um, the, the big thing that we anticipate seeing in phase two is, is really being more inclusive um, in the NEPA process, giving stakeholders the opportunity to provide input, and especially from an environmental justice perspective. So environmental justice is, is the notion where um, projects that have environmental impacts, for example, emissions, air quality impacts, shouldn't automatically go in populations that are you know, lower income, um, you know, socioeconomically um, different, right? That historically those populations have had a hard time getting a voice, right? So they just get ramrodded with these projects that are perhaps a negative to their community. Um, so that there's a realization that that's not a good thing, yeah. right? So I think we'll see more emphasis. Already the Biden administration has made a point of this. Um, the EPA has some new tools. I mean, actually, I think there's a scout blog coming out soon on the, on the EJ screening tool uh, that EPA has developed to help um, action proponents do a thorough and informed analysis of the impacts of their projects, especially as it relates to environmental justice communities, you know, uh, low income, socioeconomically um, challenged areas to make sure that they have a voice in the NEPA process. So um, that's where I think we're headed. Um, there's still an 
a uh, an emphasis on doing NEPA faster mm -hmm. and more concise, right? That's not going away, and that's a great thing. I think as NEPA protect practitioners, we can do it faster, we can do it more concise, and we can use plain language so that you know these stakeholders understand what's going on. Yeah. They're not just overwhelmed with these. 25 cent words and going, what, what are you trying to say here? Really? Right. Yeah. Um, that can all go in a technical appendix that doesn't count towards your page length. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then it's summarized in plain English in the appropriate resource area. So faster, funnier, shorter, uh, page length, uh, more environmental justice, more greenhouse gas considerations, more opportunities for stakeholder involvement. I think that is where there we're, we're headed. And I, th I think these are all good things. Yeah, going back to the environmental justice piece, I remember a lot from my, uh, I have a city planning educational background. I know you have your AICP certification. Um, seeing where a lot of infrastructure historically has been built and where a lot of projects are selected historically, there's pretty massive impact to a lot of uh, you know, lower income areas or like you said, areas without, without a voice and definitely seeing an increase in not only awareness of that, but also seeing where, you know, no build op options or uh, infrastructure removal, you know, becomes an option in certain areas. So definitely seeing an increase in that. Ryan, what do you, you know, as a practitioner that's within, you know, federal contracting space, what do you see as any trends coming up with um, the environmental consulting business as far as what's going to be focus or just the overall volume of work that is coming out with right now? Yeah. Um, well, selfishly, we hope it keeps coming yeah. and it increases, <laughs> right? We want to see more of more of these projects, more of the federal government funding for infrastructure. I mean, as a taxpayer, first first and foremost, we've got to invest back into our country in the infrastructure, bridges, roads, renewable energy. Absolutely. Um, you know, these sorts of things to to address the deteriorating infrastructure we have, right? It helps with jobs as well. Uh, investment in our communities. Um, and then on the Department of Defense side, our armed forces and our veterans, Veterans Affairs and the Coast Guard, they need the facilities to, one, provide the space for their personnel to train, right, with new technologies, new platforms. World War II era airspace is not going to accommodate, you know, the F-22, yeah. right? It needs a lot more room to train in to maximize its new technologies, new capabilities. So, um, and then uh, we're doing a fair amount of work for Veterans Affairs, right? So our, our veterans, I, I'm one too, right? I'm going to end up in a VA hospital someday, <laughs> right? <laughs> Getting some help. Um, our veterans deserve the very best health care and the very best facilities in which to receive those, those services, Absolutely. right? So um, VA's a lot of their uh, infrastructure is older. It's um, prior military infrastructure. Um, and a lot of credit to the VA and Congress for giving them funding. They are improving their infrastructure, their buildings, their hospitals, uh, supporting infrastructure, parking structures, all these things so veterans can have an even better experience when they go in to get the health care that they've earned. Right. right. So um, I think we'll continue to see investment in these projects, but before they can put that shovel in the dirt, chat, what do they got to do? They got to do the environmental analysis. That's right. They got to do that NEPA thing. So exactly. So as long as, you know, NEPA is, is still a, a law and it, it's not going anywhere, right? Back in 2020, I was a little afraid. Yeah. You know, what exactly yeah. is going to happen? Is NEPA gone? Right? That, that, right. That would hurt. <laughs> yeah. That would hurt. Yeah. So, you know, NEPA is, I think it's a fantastic uh, regulation. It's intends to do good. It, it's not meant to slow things down. Yeah. You know, unfortunately, we've seen that. So I think if we go back to what what it is or what's meant to be and and practice great great NEPA, um, then we can help facilitate these important projects for our nation, uh, for our veterans, our men and women in service. You know, the the USGS, right? How cool! Can I talk about that project? Yeah, yeah let's go ahead. Yeah. All right. So uh, US Geological Survey, right? Uh, you don't hear a whole lot about them, but um, Science of the Earth, you know, what's going on there? So earthquakes happen, especially in, in the West Coast. Uh, so one of the projects, you know, we've been working on 150 plus CADEXs. Uh, these are for the placement of scientific, you know, monitoring equipment 
in the ground, right? It's basically a probe that sits in the ground, and I'm probably going to mess this up, um, but when an earthquake happens, there's different waves that come out. Like the first wave is the S wave, um, and it comes out, and it's not necessarily the one that causes the damage, but it's the fastest moving wave. But detection systems can pick it up and know that that's heralding the more the damaging P wave. Maybe I got them backwards, but I think I think I'm right. Um, and right. P P wave has much more amplitude. It's slower. That's the one that causes all the damage. So the amount of time between those two waves, depending on where you are in relationship to the epic center, you could get some time to prepare, yeah. right? And get yourself in a doorway. Or if you're a utility provider, you can throw the switch and lock things down. Or if you're in a school, you know, or if you're an um, emergency responder, right? right. You yeah. know, okay, load up. We're going to have some stuff here to go deal with. Coastal area to get yeah. up, get up, up on higher ground. That's right. Tsunami warning, yeah. right? So um, it's it's rewarding to do work that that matters. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just walked into that one. Hey, that's the name of the podcast. That's right. Um, because doing the categorical exclusions for these early warning, earthquake early warning systems matters, right? Because if someone can get a couple seconds notice that a major earthquake is headed their way and they can take some action to protect themselves and their loved ones, dude. That's work that matters, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, we help make that possible. And that project in particular with some of our emergency management background, you know, yeah. really, really excites us. Yeah. We had another project recently that um, our team just uh, finished between Scout and us that at um, Fort Bliss, the um, introduction yeah. of the joint light tactical vehicle, mm -hmm. we completed an analysis of the environmental impacts of that, and that's been finalized. So. Uh, warfighter readiness has yep. increased because those training activities can uh, can start now. Exactly. Yeah. Great example. They, yep. they, they need to have the the tools to go out and do their training, right? Exactly. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Got a lot of uh, exciting projects and in the works and more to come, I'm sure. So yes. Yeah. This is getting to be that that time of year, right? Christmas is coming. Yeah. yeah. Federal, yeah. federal year. GovCon Fiscal Christmas. Year, right. Yeah. Yeah. I look forward to that. And um, I know there's going to be, you know, continued opportunities for us to work together. Um, we greatly appreciate you and your team and Mark. Uh, it's when a new company starts, you can do one of two things, right? You can step on their neck and say, nope, good luck. Not, you're not for us, or you can say, "All right, let's give it a shot." And you know, you maybe step on your neck is a little, little, <laughs> little strong. But you can say, "No, thank yeah, you, good yeah. luck." Yeah. You know, depends uh, who it is. Depends on who it is, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, you guys took a chance on us, and I, I feel it's been a mutually beneficial, Absolutely. You know, relationship. Yep. Absolutely, yeah. we're we're very appreciative of you and Melanie and Jason and all the quality. Uh, subcontracted work that you've done for us, and we were we were excited late last year when we had the opportunity to uh, be your sub. Yes, on a project. <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, we remember, and that's something I tell our team a lot: is you got to remember those people that helped you out. You know, and that's that's not just a work thing; that's a life thing, right? Yeah, if someone absolutely. helps you out, or you know, um, I don't know, the silly thing like I give blood, right? And I really don't like doing it, but I do it because it can help keep somebody alive, right? right. So. Um, finding ways to help those that have helped you, right? It's important. So it comes back to relationships, right? Yeah. I think that's how yeah. we start. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. All comes back to relationships. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Ryan, for joining us on the Work That Matters podcast. We're glad to have you here, and it was uh, great to hear about, you know, Scout Environmental and, and your successes. So, yeah, looking forward to the future. Right on. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. I, you, know, you guys are fantastic partners, and even more than that, fantastic people. So thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, just for you, uh, go Padres. Yes. <laughs> right. Go Padres. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into this episode of Work That Matters, the official Shaleda podcast. Learn more about us at shaleda.com. C-H-L-O-E-T-A.com.